South Lebanon, night of September 4th to 5th, 1997. That evening, after sunset, 16 Israeli commandos of Special Forces Unit Shayatet 13 land on the Lebanese shore between Tyre and Sidon, slightly north of the town of Ansaria. They're on a mission to plant explosives and assassinate a senior member of Hezbollah. They disembark on a stretch of uninhabited coastline and begin moving inland, crossing a road and into a plantation, shadowed by friendly drones, providing a live feed back to IDF command in real time. The Ford scout team reach a wall with an iron gate, which leads to an orchard. After breaking the gate and moving into the orchard, there's a click, followed by an explosion. A claymore mine is detonated, killing and maiming several commandos. This alerts the other team, which quickly advances and begins firing toward the area identified. Just 14 seconds later, a second claymore goes off, shooting out ball bearings, killing the commander. At the same time, Hezbollah fighters open fire with assault rifles, raining down lead on their enemy, followed by a third explosion as the explosives carried by one of the Israelis are triggered, killing him instantly. Chaos ensues, with bullets flying in a short but violent firefight. Within just a few minutes, 11 Israelis are dead, and 4 more wounded. Only the radio operator survives, and he quickly calls for a medivac. Moments later, Cobra helicopters arrive, firing 20mm autocannons and missiles in order to provide cover as the medivac team recovers the dead and wounded. A commando backup team, known as Sarayat Matkal, also arrives to assist with retrieving their fallen comrades, setting up a perimeter. Hezbollah and other militants continue firing on the Israelis with mortars and machine guns, killing a military doctor. Israeli commandos and helicopters continue to lay down fire as the rescue team frantically searches for all the dead. Four hours after the first explosion, which took place at 41 minutes past midnight, the last transport helicopter takes off with its cargo of dead and wounded. All but the body of Itamar Ilya, who had literally been blown to pieces by the explosives he was carrying, were evacuated. It was all over. Eleven elite Israeli commandos and one doctor were dead, with four others wounded. This was a humiliating defeat for the occupation. Only two Hezbollah fighters had been wounded. However, some sources claim six Hezbollah and Amal militants had been killed during the fighting. Additionally, two civilians were also dead, as well as one injured. Either way, this was a major victory for Hezbollah. So what happened? What went wrong? How did Hezbollah inflict such a crushing defeat on one of Israel's most elite units? This was supposed to be a routine raid, similar to dozens of previously successful incursions deep inside Lebanon, far from IDF-controlled territory. Just one month before this raid, the Special Forces Unit Battalion of the Golani Brigade conducted a mission just a few kilometers away, in the vicinity of Nebataya, successfully assassinating a local resistance commander. There was nothing unusual about this mission. For the IDF, this was intolerable. They needed answers. An inquiry was quickly opened, which concluded that the ambush had not been planned, and the commandos simply ran into a Hezbollah patrol, and the first explosion was that of the explosives carried by one of the commandos, alerting the local Hezbollah fighters. In other words, it was just bad luck. The main problem with this theory is that this was not Hezbollah-controlled territory, but rather that of Amal, another militia group. Although they did cooperate, and were part of the overall resistance against Israeli occupation of Lebanon, they kept out of each other's way. Yoav Gallant, a former Shayatet 13 commander, took personal charge of the investigation as he was not satisfied with the outcome. Having left only seven months prior to this botched operation, 
he was determined to find out what actually happened. Upon observing the destroyed equipment, ball bearings, or metal marbles, could be seen embedded. The same type of bearings were also found in the fallen commandos. This contradicted the first report claiming that the explosion was not related to enemy fire, because the IDF explosives did not consist of ball bearings. Furthermore, a safety procedure had been put in place requiring all IDF explosives to be x-rayed. The x-rays and serial numbers of the explosives in question had been examined by investigators who found no metal marbles. Also, they visited the production facility where it was found that the explosives were cast as a single unit, making it impossible for any other items to be affixed, such as packed marbles, thus proving it was in fact enemy involvement. Despite this, it was still concluded that most of the deaths and injuries were caused by the IDF explosives carried by one of the commandos, and that Hezbollah had no prior knowledge of the raid, and the incident was put down to chance. Almost a year later, in August of 1998, an investigation into the possibility of Hezbollah having obtained prior knowledge to the raid, allowing them to plan an ambush, was opened. This led to a second inquiry commission which was tasked with investigating the explosives and intelligence. As with the first inquiry, it was found that the explosives carried by the commandos were in order and not the primary cause of the fatalities and injuries. Despite this, the Military Intelligence Directorate, or MID, insisted that no foreign explosives were involved and retained the original report that the commandos were killed and maimed by their own explosives, again in complete contradiction to its own investigation. Naturally, this begged further questions and raised accusations of conspiracy theories. Given his personal attachment to Shiatet 13, Gallant refused to accept these results and conducted his own investigations. He examined all the intelligence material speaking with anyone he could who was involved in the operation, and pursuing all lines of inquiry. Upon doing so, it was discovered that a vehicle had been seen by a surveillance aircraft only two hours prior to the raid, parked on a road which was along the commander's planned route of advance. However, this information failed to reach the raiders, because the pilot had relayed this to IDF command where the soldier responsible for inputting this information marked the location of this vehicle incorrectly, and thus it was not even known by the team on the ground. This mistake alone may have led to the disaster. But there was more. Israeli UAV drones routinely operated in the area, providing imagery in real time, and recorded video for IDF headquarters. In the weeks leading up to the mission, these drones had been collecting intelligence in preparation and to help plan the route for the commandos. There was a possibility that Hezbollah had intercepted the signal of these drones and were able to access the same imagery and data that IDF command were viewing. That is to say, Hezbollah had successfully hacked Israeli transmissions and could see everything the IDF could see. Furthermore, there may even have been a double agent inside Israel. In 1997, it was not common practice for drones to use encrypted messaging. This was relatively new technology. It was very rarely used as it was assumed the enemy did not have the capability to intercept UAV signals. Although the IDF knew that Hezbollah were visually monitoring drone activity from the ground, they took measures to mislead them by flying over areas unrelated to the mission and take photographs all along the coastline, under the assumption that Hezbollah could not possibly know they were focusing on specific landmarks as part of the mission, such as orchards, a gate, or a house. It became increasingly obvious that the entire mission had been compromised. 
How else could Hezbollah have known when and where the raid would take place, let alone the exact route of the commandos? The idea that Hezbollah set up a chance ambush and planted explosives in an orchard far from any military installations or high-ranking individuals that required security was clearly absurd. Given the location, this was highly unlikely. The commission had considered the possibility of drone footage being leaked, but could not confirm this, and thus kept to the original conclusion. The incident was a tragic accident, and just bad luck. For Gallant, however, there was no doubt. It was the leak from the drone. And there was something else. In the hours preceding the mission, Hezbollah went radio silent. This was omitted from the report, but was crucial. Radio silence is standard practice when waiting for the enemy, or when an attack is imminent. The IDF misjudged this as Hezbollah going on high alert in anticipation for an Israeli attack in retaliation following a bomb earlier in the day, killing three Israelis in Jerusalem. Although the second report concluded that it was likely that Hezbollah collected enough leaked information from the drone's unencrypted broadcast for an ambush to be planned, the IDF chief refused to accept this, reverting back to the conclusion of the first commission, a random ambush and tragic accident. With no solid conclusion and unanswered questions, a third inquiry began. The focus was around the possible leak, which was to be examined further. Two of the commission members determined that Hezbollah had planned the ambush based entirely on estimations, with no exact details of the time, manner, or the route Shayatet had planned. However, the third member, an air officer, concluded that Hezbollah had intercepted unencrypted UAV transmissions, thus allowing them to set up the deadly trap with precision. The third officer's conclusion was not accepted, and thus the third commission inquiry ended once again with the reasoning of the initial investigation reports. Chance ambush. Bad luck. Tragic failure. Case closed. This remained the official narrative until the 9th of August 2010, when Hassan Nasrallah, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, made a TV appearance, revealing something that would throw everything back into question, forcing the incident back into the spotlight. A video was presented claiming to be that of IDF drone signals from the summer of 1997, and that his men set up the ambush for Shai Tet 13 near Ansaria. Israelis were furious. This smoking gun could not be ignored. IDF chief Gabi Ashkenazi ordered an immediate commission inquiry. The case was reopened for a fourth time, and both the Navy and the MID took part. One of the Navy's top intelligence officers, Gabi Agmon, was designated as head of the commission, which included seven representatives from all relevant bodies. He had formerly been the intelligence officer for Shayatet 13, up until only two weeks prior to the failed operation. The first port of call was to establish the authenticity of the video released by Nasrallah. The commission quickly got to work, meticulously examining all archived drone footage from the time. Their analysis found that the video released by Hezbollah was indeed genuine and compiled from six separate clips, edited together into one. These included images and video transmitted from an intelligence aircraft and UAV drones prior to and during the mission itself, including the rescue operation. Not only did Hezbollah have intelligence prior to the raid, but they had a visual of the entire operation in real time. They had hacked the UAV in the sky as the incident was unfolding, and were sharing the same live feed the IDF were viewing back at HQ. Mission Command were completely unaware that they had been compromised. Most shocking, however, was the final clip of the six-part collage. This was footage from the 31st of August, 
of 1997, four days prior to the raid, taken during daylight, showing a continuous and focused scan of the landing beach, the planned route, and where the claymores went off. From this evidence, it was assumed that Hezbollah most likely had intercepted all five hours' worth of footage from the 13 previous drone sorties in the run-up to the mission. Hezbollah had it all. They knew everything. This was no accident. There was no chance ambush. This wasn't achieved through guesswork. Every part of the mission had been exposed. The IDF may as well have called Nasrallah himself directly and disclosed every detail over the phone. After the commission concluded, without a doubt, that Hezbollah had intercepted the UAV signals, which allowed them to plan and execute the ambush successfully, the question was, did Hezbollah obtain the footage independently or from a third party, such as an agent or a foreign government, such as Syria or Iran? The fact that the UAV transmission had been intercepted in real time would suggest that no third party was involved, as this took place over Lebanese airspace, far from Syria and Iran. Thus, it was confirmed that Hezbollah had achieved this intelligence gathering independently, something the IDF did not think was possible. It was assumed Hezbollah did not have the technical capacity to do this. This vindicated Yoav Gallant and proved his suspicions to be correct all along. The fourth and final commission concluded that Hezbollah had intercepted UAV signals and successfully downloaded images and video, allowing them to set up an ambush with great accuracy. Although the exact timing was unknown, it is likely that the ambush was set up every night for up to two weeks prior. Also, according to the explosive experts, most of the hits on the commandos came from the front and the right, which indicated the claymores had been planted with prior knowledge of the direction from which the commandos would be approaching. The lethal results proved the intentional direction the explosives had been placed to match the movements of the Shayatet team, as most of the explosive force of a claymore mine is concentrated in a specific direction, where the ball bearings are fired out in a relatively narrow arc. Therefore, a claymore needs to be strategically placed, facing the target for maximum effect. It does not explode in all directions equally. It has a blast arc rather than a blast radius, concentrating the blast force for maximum lethality when placed correctly. It took 13 years and four investigations for the IDF to finally admit there was a high probability that Hezbollah had planned the ambush in advance. Needless to say, encrypted signaling was implemented across all IDF drones and other intelligence gathering methods and communications. On the 25th of May, 1998, the remains of Itamar Ilya, along with the body parts of two other fallen Shayatat soldiers, were exchanged for the bodies of 40 Hezbollah fighters and Lebanese soldiers, including Hadi Nasrallah, the son of Hassan Nasrallah, who had been killed in action just one week after the Ansaria ambush. They were also able to secure the release of 65 Lebanese prisoners, adding to the success of the ambush. The IDF's refusal to accept the fact that they had been outsmarted by what they perceived as an inferior people, damaged their prestige and image. No one accepted fault, therefore nothing was learned. The fallout from this debacle proved Shayatet 13 was not invincible, as Hezbollah demonstrated its capabilities, not only on the battlefield, but in espionage and technical ability. The pride of the IDF leaders led to further humiliations at the hands of Hezbollah, who eventually forced the IDF to completely withdraw from Lebanon, as well as their defeat in the 2006 July War, when the IDF barely made it 500 meters into Lebanon, before being forced to retreat back into occupied Palestine, or Israel, as the occupiers like to call it. 